an experiment, a new ministry in our church out west that uh, was, was an attempt to reach a whole different crowd of, of teenagers. Um, and, and it was completely and totally a sports ministry. And I won't get into how it all worked and everything, but this is my point. We called it OTB Sports, OTB standing for Off the Bench. And it's like most sports we get into as kids, as we get more and more involved, uh, there's more and more time sitting on the bench while other people are praying and we're going in and out. And this whole idea uh, of what we started was there's no spectators. Everybody is in the game. Nobody's ever sitting on the bench. And that was a huge uh, factor for us in that, to engage everybody regardless of their skill and all that kind of stuff. And I want to just start with that thinking that in a lot of ways, if you were here the last two weeks, that's what we're talking about in this teaching series in regards to our church. As a church, there's no spectators. The whole intent of church isn't that we can just come and enjoy an hour and then leave and not engage with people, not engage with stuff, not engage in ministry, not engage in learning. No spectators. Everybody off the bench and engaged in the family and what we're doing. And so this is week three of this teaching series. And just really, really, really short recap. Week one, Chris uh, from, from Blue Water Church um, was here and he talked about there's no deck chairs on this boat. And how everybody picks up a paddle if this thing's going to move in any kind of intentional direction. Uh, with any momentum at all, it takes everybody with a paddle making that happen. He talked about that very much in the context of love. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is an often quoted chapter on love and the definition of love. Uh, it's nestled perfectly in the context, completely 100% in the context of this, of the body of Christ, of the church, and how we pick up paddles and paddle together. And love is the core to all of that. Last week we looked at a very specific um, situation in Scripture in the pool of Bethesda. How Jesus would go out of his way and, and he entered the city even most often. At the gate where all of the needy people gathered. And we talked about that, that heart in people. And many of you responded and said, that's me. That I, my, I'm wired and I'm built in my heart of compassion and empathy for people in need. And we need to release you uh, into that and into serving in that way. Um, some of us by very nature are the kind of people that we see someone in need or we see a homeless person and we divert our eyes or we walk in the other side of the road. Uh, so we don't, But other people are not like that. Other people are just absolutely driven in their heart of empathy and compassion to, to help. And, and if that's you, we need you. We need all of you working in here and in our town and on our streets to be that. But all of these different things we're going to look at over the next number of weeks and in the last couple of weeks, they all work in tandem. They all overlap. They all work together. They come alongside. And so we're going to look at a different characteristic each week. All right? So... Uh, let me give you a little bit of backstory to where we're going to be today. If you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 9. I'm going to tell you a story here. We're going to look at a story in Scripture. Uh, it's very familiar to many of you, but it's not the character we're going to look at isn't the main part of this story. In, in Acts chapter 9, we have Saul's conversion. And let me go through that really, really quick. I don't want to take a ton of time on it because Saul is not our character we're looking at today. But, but right at the beginning of chapter 9, Saul is in Jerusalem and he is a religious leader. He is a very elite religious leader and his job is to hunt down and arrest, hassle, and even kill all of the Christians. And so he's doing that in Jerusalem, and they've got quite a reputation, this horrible thing going, and he gets permission from the church leadership to now spread out from Jerusalem, go to other towns, and um, in the first couple of verses, he gets official letters to go and do that in verse 3. He's approaching Damascus, and Jesus himself, the crucified, buried, resurrected Jesus, stops him on the road. And has a conversation with him. That moment 
defines probably the biggest life transformation of any one person we see in all of the Bible. Maybe all of history. Because here's a guy who was, was uh, 100% soul bent on stopping Christianity. And all of a sudden, he becomes one of the most uh, historic leaders in our faith. And, and so we have this situation going on here. He gets to Damascus. He's alone. He's now blinded temporarily. God goes to speak to a Christian man there, Ananias, and says, I want you to go over there. He's waiting here. And he, in verse 13, says, um, I've heard people talk about this guy and what he's been doing in Jerusalem. There's no question he's afraid, right? But he obeys. He goes. And in verse 17, Ananias finds Saul. And Ananias begins the process of making a disciple out of this brand new convert. And it happens very quickly because we see right away that Paul started, uh, it, we're in verse uh, 20, he immediately began preaching. And, and he's preaching in the synagogue where all the Jews would gather in Damascus and he's talking about all of this Old Testament and all of the prophecy and all of the law that they would all know well. But he's piecing it together, connecting the dots, showing them it's all pointing to Jesus. That Jesus is the Messiah we're waiting for. All who heard him, verse 21, were amazed. Right? You can imagine. Isn't this the guy that's been ravaging and killing and hunting down and arresting all the Christians. We've heard about what's happened in Jerusalem, they say. And here he is. See, they knew who Saul was. No question about that. But Saul's preaching in verse 22 was so powerful, the Jews in Damascus, in Damascus couldn't refute what he was talking about. And it was only a matter of time before many of them got completely bent out of shape. And very quickly it escalated that they wanted to kill him, verse 23. And they sat and watched him. They monitored every move and they were waiting for the time when they could murder him. Well, God gave Saul the heads up. They hung him out of the, a window out of the city gates and lowered him in a basket and he ran for his life. Where does he go? He goes back home to Jerusalem. What a crazy story, isn't it? What a crazy story. Who is the person that you can think of in your life or in your world, uh, in, in the world today, who would be the, the, the one who is most against Christianity? Who would be the most loud and aggressive person against, if you can picture that person in your mind, and what if, on Sunday morning, we're all gathering around, we're checking our kids in, we're getting our coffee, we're finding our seats, and that person walks in here. Can you feel that tension? You can feel what's happening there already. Um, we haven't even been introduced to our main character yet. So verse 26, Saul has been chased from the city, or fear of his life, and he arrives in Jerusalem, verse 26, and he tries to meet the believers. But they're all afraid. Well, no doubt. They did not believe that he had truly become a believer. He comes back to Jerusalem. They're all afraid. His job in Jerusalem was to rampage the Christians. To find them all. Hunt them down. Collect them in. Hassle them. Kill them. Arrest them. Put them in prison. Whatever he could do. And he shows up in church. Here's the thing. They had no idea what had happened to him in Damascus. This was, set, you know, who knows how much time was there. We don't really say it. just says after a while. But he's back home. He's still public enemy number one. Maybe they were even praying that he would never come back. And here he is. He walks right into church. So imagine if he was here this morning, standing over by the coffee. The rest of us are all pressed up against this corner. Right? Nobody make eye contact. I don't want him to identify me. And we're afraid. Well, here, enter Barnabas. Look at verse 27. Just such, such a simple sentence. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles 
and told him how Saul had, been, had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. You got that picture in your mind. He's over there getting a coffee. The whole rest of the 250 of us are pressed into that corner as hard as we possibly can. Barnabas, the only one, he walks over there. He reaches out his hand. He shakes his hand. He puts his hand on his shoulder, turns around, and starts bringing him over towards us. That was a risky step to take. Did Barnabas really know what had happened with Saul? What, was it, what if he was wrong? Lives would be at stake. Did Barnabas know that what, that what, would, what would happen with Saul and how it would turn out? No. Did Barnabas know that uh, Saul would go on and preach the gospel everywhere from, Rome, from Jerusalem all the way to Rome? No. Did Barnabas know that Paul would end up writing almost half of our New Testament? No. Did Barnabas uh, totally, 100%, was he sure of Saul's conversion? No. But he acted on what he believed to be true. Why was Barnabas willing to walk across the room, to step out on that risk, and nobody else would? I know some of you here already this morning are saying, hey, that's me. Not sure if anybody would want to admit it yet in this situation. But first, look. look. First, Barnabas courageously walked across the room to welcome the outsider, the stranger, the one that was alone. Then, he became the advocate. And he brought him to the rest and he boldly connected Saul to the group as an advocate. Look at verse 28. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went around all Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas connected Saul with the people who could uh, train him, who could teach him, who could love on him. Barnabas didn't just say, hi, welcome. Have we met before? And then that was it. He didn't just meet him and introduce him to somebody else and then go on looking for somebody else. No, Barnabas... Uh, connected him intentionally as an advocate, connected him with people who would disciple him. Verse 29 and 30 tells us that Paul's preaching got so bold and so strong. Now this is back in Jerusalem, remember. And it wasn't that long ago that these folks had killed Jesus. And here's Paul, one of them, flipped around now, and he's preaching so boldly and so aggressively that the old school Jews are getting more and more bent out of shape. And step one, kill him. We had finally got rid of Jesus. We got to get rid of him. This has happened in Damascus already. And now he's in Jerusalem, and the same thing happened. This Christian thing's not going real well for Saul. The Christians took Saul here and uh, took him to the coast and put him on a boat and he sailed back home to where he grew up in Tarsus. Failure? Defeat? Frustrated? Who knows? Two attempts at ministry, great response, murder threats. Twice. But we're not talking about Paul today, we're looking at Barnabas. So let me highlight Barnabas a little bit. Who was Barnabas in all of this? Barnabas, uh, start, sorry, Barnabas starts actually in chapter 4 and goes all the way to 15. We're not going to go through all of that this morning. But if you do go back to chapter 4, um, just a little bit here in chapter 4 introduces us. And, and here's what's happening in the church. The church is growing and thriving and generosity is percolating like crazy. People are excited. They're meeting people's needs. And it says, all the pe- believers were united in heart and mind. They felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was on them all. There was no needy people among them, because people who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money to the apostles to give to, the need- to people in need. Now look at this, verse 36. For example... Here's a guy named Joseph, 
who the, the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi. He came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Joseph. His name's not even Barnabas. His name is Joseph. But he's nicknamed for his character. Okay, when we think son of encouragement, we think somebody who is an encourager, what do we think? We think of um, th the word encourage, right? Is to put courage into, to give you courage, to build you up, to strengthen you, to come alongside you, um, to, your, is your cheerleader. This is the person that's, that's writing encouragement cards. Remember when churches used to have encouragement cards in the back of the pew? And Remember that? I remember that. Maybe not. Um, but this is the person that's, that, that says the right thing at the right time and builds us up and strengthens us. Uh, they have your back. Um, they make you feel okay and capable and energized. And we see all of those things in Barnabas over the course of this story. Let's look at a couple of those things specifically this morning. Um, back to chapter 9, where we were before, because we see the first couple of things there. He sees Paul, Saul in church on the other side of the building all alone, off by himself, the rest of the church in the opposite corner. Uh, you can picture that, right? How come he's the only guy that will walk over there? Fear or no fear, he's the only guy that greeted him. Barnabas actually brings him over across the room, introducing him. And they all knew who Saul was. To the church, Saul was a problem. But to Barnabas, he saw incredible potential. To the church, they saw him in his past. To Barnabas, he saw his future. To the church, they saw what he had been, and Barnabas saw what he could become. That's what encouragers do. They see potential. They look to the future. They focus on what people might be once forgiven and once the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them and begins to work in them. Barnabas walked across the room with his hand open for the handshake. And Barnabas uh, becomes Saul's advocate, connecting Saul with the group of people who would teach him and train him and love on him. Is there anybody here? who would take that kind of risk for somebody like Saul? Is there anyone here who would become that kind of advocate and a voice for someone who has no voice? Who is that in this room? Some of us now are uncomfortably saying, ooh, that's not me. That's okay. Because other people here are really leaning in and their ears are perked up. To see somebody disconnected across the room, alone, Walk across the room. Probably, in the church context, you've seen this. Or maybe you've felt this. Now, we had a time a few minutes ago where we stand up and shake hands. And if you're that Barnabas-type person, you already know who's new here and awkward. And as soon as you get released to go shake hands, why are we not making a beeline for those people? If you're the Barnabas, go and sit beside them if this is happening. You've seen it in the school cafeteria too, right? I had a volunteer in my youth ministry out west whose name was Sarah. Sarah was brilliant at this. And at the beginning of youth group, we had about 15 or 20, maybe half an hour where uh, there was video games happening and there was other stuff happening. The gym was open and balls were flying around. Sarah had a unique ability to look and see who, what kid was by themselves. And I would continually, week after week, watch her go over to the kid on playing basketball by themselves and start shooting hoops with them. And very naturally, over the course of the next five minutes, would corral in another kid and corral in another kid and corral in another kid. And all of a sudden, there's a group of four or five playing basketball and she would quietly step out. She was brilliant at that. This is the connector. This is Barnabas. Anybody yet saying, hey, that's me? The next time we see Barnabas is in chapter 11. In chapter 11, Stephen has been killed already. He was the first to be killed for his faith. And that caused a whole bunch of stuff to happen. News of that spread everywhere. Persecution and, 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 and martyrdom started to happen more and more and more. And Christians scattered around the world. 
As they went, they started preaching the truth of Jesus, but only to Jews, because they were all Jews, right? So they'd go to the synagogues, and it was spreading within the Jews around the world. And then in verse 20 in chapter 11, it says, however, some of these people started telling the Gentiles, right? It's, this is just Jews, and it's percolating around the Jews, and all of a sudden, some people are starting to tell people that are not Jews, and they really struggled with this. The next four chapters goes back and forth and back and forth on this issue. The Gentiles were beginning to believe in Jesus and the fantastic response. They were gobbling up this truth. There's people believing there was life change and the Holy Spirit power was happening and the church in Jerusalem heard about this. And this is where Barnabas comes in because he's in the church in Jerusalem, right? And in verse 22 in chapter 11 the church gets Barnabas and sends him to Antioch, where this is happening, to say, go and investigate. He continued to read that story there. It's brilliant because he sees the power of God. He sees what's happening. It's genuine and true. And he doesn't even go back to tell them. He stays. He stays and teaches and coaches and mentors these new people. He's encouraging them. He's so wrapped up in what's happening there that he stays there to encourage them, to ensure their success. This is a brand new church. And all of a sudden, he becomes a huge spark plug in it. And his, uh, he, he's almost walked into a, a gold mine of God working. Right? And he becomes a really key cog in this. Now, he's the encourager. So what happens in his mind? What clicks? Look at chapter 11, verse 25. Saul. Saul was in Damascus. They tried to kill him. He went to Jerusalem, tried to kill him. He's gone home to Tarsus. What's happening? He gets on a boat, travels to Tarsus, grabs Saul, very gently dusts him off, encourages him, brings him back to, the, to this place, to Antioch, where God's love and the Holy Spirit's power is percolating and generating. It's great. It's a safe environment. And he reinstates Paul, sets him up for success in ministry again. And they stay there for almost a year together, shoulder to shoulder, teaching and guiding this church. And it says there that this is the first place where followers of Jesus were called Christians. Now remember, murder attempts on his life in Damascus, murder attempts on his life in Jerusalem. Not a great few month, first few months. Paul was getting beat up, doing what he was made to do. And he heads home. Barnabas hits the jackpot of God's miraculous work and results in booming ministry, and he instantly thinks Saul needs to be here. He needs to be part of this. He needs to be in this action. So the first time, he walked across the room to shake his hand, but it didn't end there. This handshake and then connecting was an ongoing commitment to Saul. He gets in a boat, picks up a broken guy, gently, lovingly dusts him off, sets him up in a safe place to get going again. For a whole year they met. So Barnabas, now is going on two years, he's been away from home. He was just sent up to go and investigate to see if this was genuine. He hasn't even come back to report yet. No doubt wishing he could go back home. In, in 11, uh, chapter 30, they're still together in Antioch, and a, and a prophet comes up and says there's going to be a famine, so the church in Antioch that Paul and, and, si and, and Barnabas are still working at, they decide to take this collection and they get this massive donation to send to the Christians in Jerusalem where they're struggling now. And they send Barnabas and Saul to take it. Okay, is Saul ready to go back to Jerusalem? He's ready because Barnabas has been walking with him and encouraging him and strengthening him, and getting him back on top. Barnabas was the one who walked across the room and welcomed the stranger. Barnabas put the effort in, became the advocate, and connected him to the group. And then Barnabas, over the long haul, was the one who was walking alongside Saul. In Acts chapter 12, the next chapter, Saul and Barnabas are still in Jerusalem. 
Remember, Barnabas is finally back home after all of this, and uh, he just went to investigate. But, but does Barnabas say, okay, Saul, it's all good. You're on your own. Go on back to Antioch. Make it happen. I've done my bit. Now you're on your own. He doesn't. Look at 12, verse 25. They finished their mission to Jerusalem, and they returned to Antioch, and they took John Mark. Now, we don't know who John Mark is at this point. There's no reference to John Mark yet. Um, but in 12, verse 12, we know the situation while they're in Jerusalem. Peter had been in prison, and an angel came in the middle of the night and loosened his chains and sent him off, and he heads across town to where a prayer meeting was happening, and the, the people were praying for his release. He bangs on the door, and they look, and they don't believe it's him. They lock the door again. He's banging on the door. finally gets in, and it's Peter, and he tells this story. That was at John Mark's mother's house. Okay, so Barnabas and Saul are in the middle of all of this, and they see this young man, and what wheels start turning in Barnabas' head? The wheels are turning, and Barnabas starts all over again this process. It's not just a one-time deal. This is his life. This is who he is. He's walking across the room. He's connecting people. He's calling them forward and walking alongside them. And Barnabas here, with John Mark, starts this whole process again. And if we skip to chapter 15, uh, they are on a missions trip. And John, uh, Barnabas and Saul and John Mark are on a trip planting more churches, and John Mark bails. He quits, he storms off, he walks back, he goes back to Jerusalem. You can imagine Barnabas, the disappointment, the frustration... Barnabas and Saul both respond very differently here. Saul says, nope, let him go. I'm done with him. Barnabas is like, I should have left you in Tarsus, Saul. You feel Barnabas' pain here? John Mark's abandoned them and gone home. He has so much potential. He needs to be back. He needs to be thriving. He needs to be in the right place. Paul and Barnabas actually got so different, separated on this, that they parted ways. The first thing Barnabas did was go back, get John Mark, get in a boat, and head off to Cyprus on a trip. I hope that you're seeing the character of this guy. Barnabas didn't give up on Saul. Barnabas didn't give up on John Mark. He, he was patient with them even in their failure. Think of it this way. Uh, Barnabas, two people Barnabas influenced more than anyone else that we know of was Saul and Mark. And, and, and Saul, who, whose name was changed to Paul in chapter 13, uh, wrote 13 books of our New Testament. John Mark wrote the book Mark. The other guy that was traveling with them this whole time is Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts. And... and not a bad record for a guy who's a minor character in the Bible, right? All his ministry impact was huge, even though he's a guy that ends up in the background. Anybody resonating with that guy? Here's a list. He walked across the room to connect the disconnected. He's an advocate for people who had no voice. He was calling others to become who God created them to be. He was walking alongside people, encouraging them, strengthening and watching out for them. He was relentlessly patient and active in restoring people even when they failed. Not interested in his own status or accolades or attentions, he was setting other people up for success, walking with them for the long haul, helping them be their best. And if you resonate with that, maybe it's not all of those things. Maybe it's one of them, and you're saying, that's me. Is that you? There's probably people in this room that feel really disconnected with our church. I'm going to guess maybe even 40% of you feel disconnected. Where are our Barnabases? Imagine the church where these people are at work. We talked about caregivers last week, serving people in need. Barnabas comes into that picture and encourages both. He strengthens both. He walks with both. Last week, the caregivers, uh, as, as I heard from a lot of you, 
One of the things I heard several times was, that's me, I'm that caregiver. But when I'm giving care like that, I become vulnerable and I've really been hurt, so I've kind of backed off and shut down. More than a few of you told me that. Folks, where's Barnabas? Because some of you here need Barnabas alongside of you. Let me teach you a new word. Maybe it's not a new word for many of you. Maybe you're smarter than I was. A new word for me. The word is paraclete. Anybody know that word, paraclete? A couple of you. Really, really simple. A couple of words in, in the Bible are Greek words that never got translated into English. We just use the Greek word. Paraclete is one of those pretty much. It's made up of two words. This is from the Greek, para, which means to come alongside, and kaleo, or cleat, which means to call. So paraclete, a person that is a paraclete, simply is one who is called to come alongside others. Make sense? Where do we see this? In our legal system, a lawyer is called to come alongside you. It's a paraclete. In, in a, a, a paraclete is an intercessor, intercessor, someone who is between two people holding you together. Uh, a couple of times, there's only five times in the Bible, John is the only one that ever uses this word. And in John chapter 14, he uses it as a description of the Holy Spirit who comes alongside to help us live the Christian life. In 1 John chapter 2, he, d- he calls a paraclete, talks about Jesus, how Jesus was our advocate, who is his, the, the intercessor between God and man, and pulls us together, and he comes alongside in that sense. Who are our paracletes here? Last week when we talked about the caregivers, of course Jesus is the perfect example of that. And all of us need to become more and more and more like Jesus. So the caregiving part is not something any of us are exempt from, but there's some of us that are really wired that way. We need to release you and get you going in that. The same this week, the paraclete. Again, Jesus is the perfect example of that. And we're asked to become more and more like Jesus. So none of us are exempt from this. But some of you are wired that way. God created you that way. And we need to get off our deck chairs and start paddling. Whether that's part of an intentional ministry or that's just being you. Paul or Saul and Barnabas were really, really different Saul was the bold, aggressive teacher. Barnabas was the supporter, the encourager, the reacher. Very, very different. And look, the, the, the miraculous spread of Christianity around the world happened primarily because these two very different people and the power of the Holy Spirit worked together, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, enhancing the ministry. Some of us in the room here need a Barnabas beside us. Some of us here are Barnabas. And we need to get busy. Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. You have to be you. The cool thing is, is is, is as we engage in God's work, He will empower us with spiritual gifts. He will take our passions and our personalities and the way we're wired and put them together for us. He's created us with with a very specific place in his kingdom. But if this is you, be true to you. That's the cool thing. In, In a lot of ways, God's not asking you to jump in and pick up a paddle in a way that's not you. He wants you to be you and to engage. And he will supernaturally empower you. And your gifts and your passions and your personality will come together as we do that. If this is you, I said this last week too, there's a pad of paper in front of you and a pen. And if this is you, even any one of these aspects of the things we've looked at today, will you grab that pad and you write, hey, that's me. Put your name, write me a little note, or maybe send me an email. I'm not promising I'm going to contact you, but I want to be able to pray for you. If you're looking for a way, if that you're saying, hey, that's me, and you're looking for a way to intentionally get involved in this in a, in, 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 in a structured way, our first impressions ministry 
our ushers and our greeters and our welcome desk, and that continues on, boy, we need Barnabas. But you don't need to be involved in the program part of it. Because when we are together, it's not hard to see who's alone. Let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word that gives us examples of all of us and points us to Jesus and your power and your Holy Spirit's empowering and your dream for us. God, you created us all so unique uh, on purpose. God, may we come together in a way that all of the different parts are fitting together and functioning well and doing their bits and, and, and then empowered by the Holy Spirit. God, this would be incredible. Thank you, Jesus, for the way you have designed this community. Would you light a fire underneath each of us?